Hello, everybody. My name is Salil Tripathi, and I'm here in New York City uh, from the Institute for Human Rights and Business. And we are here today in a, a truly global setting, having a conversation on business and human rights, and in the context of what is happening around the world and the impact that it has had on supply chain in the garment sector, and focusing particularly on Bangladesh. Bangladesh, of course, has a very important day today. It is the birth anniversary of Rabindranath Tagore, um, so the national poet of both Bangladesh and of India. So it's someone we do remember. But that's the only uh, redeeming thought as such. And I hope at the end of the session, we are going to have some more redeeming things to talk about. But we are in a situation which is uh, highly fraught. I mean, it's not an easy situation at all to be in. We are going to talk about what has been happening in the context of uh, the garment sector in Bangladesh at the moment. Um, we have a few housekeeping assign announcements to make at the beginning. We have about uh, 300 people who have registered, but we are having people from all around uh, the world, from California all the way to Hong Kong. So it may be that people will be able to come in and out. Um, I'm going to start initially by speaking with my colleague, Sanchita Saxena. And uh, after that, we will be able to go from panelist to panelist with the questions that we have. Um, I have one announcement. We were going to have one more panelist, which is Rubana Huck. Uh, who is with the B Bangladesh Garment Manufacturers and Exporters Association. Unfortunately, she cannot be with us today because she's busy with the crisis management situation. The issue is pretty serious in Bangladesh. She's in meetings back to back and she's on the phone. She cannot be on a laptop or on a computer. She sends her regrets and she cannot be with, with us here. We are on an experimental uh, platform today, which is, of course, uh, Livestorm, uh, which is relatively new for many of us who have been using Zoom. But one reason we have chosen this is that it has very strong GDPR credentials, the European Union Directives for Privacy. So thank you for bearing with us in case there are technical difficulties. And we hope uh, this is a glitch-free uh, in incident. Um, this is a live streamed event. We are recording it and later on the video will be available at the end of the session uh, and on the IHRB website should we have any technical issues. You will be able to access it later. There is a tab as you can see to submit questions to the speakers. Please use that actively when you have a question. We are encouraging speakers also to engage with those in their remarks and in writing where they can manage. We will also feed as many of these into the conversations as we can. Um, we will endeavor to answer all the questions we can, and we will keep an uh, eye on, please keep an eye on the website because when we are not able to do that, we will be able to um, put the questions and answers on the website later. You may see that we may have one or two polls during the course of the webinar. Please keep an eye on the poll tab. And we also have a few more webinars to follow, which I will talk about later in the day uh, as, at the end of the program. But let me tell you right away, we had one on um, the international policy and the social contract, uh, which was uh, the recording is available on the IHRB website. And we have another one coming up on May 20 on responsible commodity trading. We will also have future web webinars and we will talk about that later as we go along today. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce my co-panelists today. I'm going to be speaking with uh, uh, Sanchita Banerjee Saxena, who runs the Shubir and Malini Chaudhary Center for Bangladesh Studies at the University of California in Berkeley. And thank you. I know it's extremely early for you, Sanchita. So thank you for making the time. It's five in the morning there. It's eight here and as far back as I mean. And then you know, it's later in the evening as we go further to the east. Um, we will also hear with from Dina Siddiqui, who is a professor, clinical professor at the New York University. She has also taught in Bangladesh. She is an expert on gender, and she is also an expert on capitalism, globalization, and issues related to the industry. She's been a long-time observer on the issue. Uh, joining us from Dhaka is, of course, Nazma Akhtar. Uh, many of you must be familiar with her. She has started out working in a factory when she was, um, um, uh, she was still a child, and then uh, started and set up her own uh, Shomilik, uh, Shomik Shang, uh, 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 union for workers. And she has been a very powerful and strong voice for empowerment. And we have met her um, on many occasions in the past. We also have Payal Jain, who is joining us from Hong Kong. And she is from uh, the company HNM. They have a very interesting story, one of the major buyers in Bangladesh. 
And the, what they have gone through, uh, particularly in the context of Bangladesh and applies beyond, is how they have worked in this particular uh, situation in terms of acting responsibly. And we will probably talk about the UN guiding principles and how companies operate on that. And we will soon be joining, I don't see her on the screen, but I'm sure she will, she'll be joining us very soon, is Ineke Zeldenruz from uh, Clean Clothes Campaign. She has spent years working on the rights of workers to organize, to participate, and be effective players. Um, I will go into some of the details later, but Sanjita, uh, opening remarks from you, please. Thank you again, Salil, for inviting me to join. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and collaboratively um, bring this webinar together. And uh, thank you to all my colleagues, really, literally from from all over the world, who are joining today. Um, I hope you all are well and safe uh, during this time. So before we get started um, in talking to some of the panelists, just very briefly to talk kind of about the sector, uh, the garment industry in Bangladesh and where we are now and sort of how we got here. You know, as probably many of you know who have observed this industry, um, you know, it goes way back, I mean, back to the 70s, really, where these industries, not only in Bangladesh, but all throughout the global south, were sort of created um, as a result of the multi-fiber arrangement. So a system of quotas for several decades that were in place, uh, sort of a trade distortion, if you will. Um, and basically, many countries, including Bangladesh, extremely, extremely dependent on this sector. So. Bangladesh, for example, currently it's 84% uh, of its exports are in, in garments and over 4 million people are employed in this industry and, and uh, millions more are affected by this industry. They're, they're in related industries. So if anything happens, I mean, the reliance on the sector is so great. If anything happens because it's such a provider of livelihoods, um, it's the, any disruption is actually extremely detrimental to so many lives. Um, so I can't sort of emphasize the, the importance of this sector, but also the, the precarity um, of it. And what has happened, you know, since the 70s, I mean, the, the, the rise of global supply chains, it, it created all these new sites of uh, production. And really, you know, from the, the, the global northern, the northern co uh, companies often were in sort of an odd uh, situation because many of uh, they were not able to reg you know regulate these suppliers all throughout that were dispersed all throughout the global south and really it was in you know sort of in the 90s when we started hearing more and more about a series of labor rights violations and it started becoming you know much more popular in the media to talk about what were the real conditions in these countries and of course bangladesh is is you know not new to series of um disasters that have taken place over over time i mean some of the significant ones have been you know in 2012 the tazreen factory fire one of the dead, deadliest fires in the nation's history and of course I mean, all, most of you will know about the Rana Plaza collapse in 2013, one of the worst industrial disasters in history, um, killing more than 1,100 people and injuring more than 2,500. So after the Rana Plaza um, disaster in 2013, I think many of us who followed the industry were really, were hoping for some sort of change in some way. And I think while there has been limited change, limited you know, a portion, I think, of Bangladesh's factories have been structurally made safer. I think there's a lot of other areas where um, not, not much progress has been made at all. Um, and we'll talk about some of these issues uh, through the webinar. Um, but, you know, we know that, I mean, workers still don't get paid a living wage. They face brutal crackdowns on any um, any time they try to organize. And you know, the, the fast fashion model that brands adhere to constantly pushes suppliers to produce quicker and faster and cheaper. Um, and the nature of global supply chains just in general and the fast fashion industry in particular are inherently at odds with good labor rights and good human rights. The nature of it is such there is a lack of information, lack of accountability, a lack of transparency, suppliers are, are forced to be hyper flexible and there are unequal power relationships. And unfortunately, because 
the, many of these issues have not been addressed. They've not been addressed over the last several decades, and especially after Rana Plaza, after the Rana Plaza disaster, that we're in a situation where the lack of real change, the nature of the global industry, and then Bangladesh's extreme dependence on the sector has, the global pandemic has just wrecked havoc on this industry and on the lives of millions of workers. So this sort of leads us to the idea about the question about responsibility. I mean, who is really responsible for, um, you know, in, for making sure that workers um, that, that workers workers can survive? Are international or global brands responsible when do they consider that these workers in Bangladesh and other parts of the world their workers? Are they held responsible when they're when they're so far over there? What are the role of domestic governments? What is the role of the business community in, in Bangladesh? And finally, I mean, how can workers at the bottom of the supply chain throughout the global south, but in particular in Bangladesh, as we're talking about today, how can they be made visible um, when they're often rendered as invisible? And how can and with and their invisibility often actually fuels these global supply chains? So what really do do workers need to do? Asma, can you start by telling us, just give us some background about how workers have been affected during this crisis and, you know, in the last few months and how the Bangladeshi unions and your organization, but other workers' rights groups, how have they tried to address this crisis? Thank you, Sanchitapa. Uh, as you know, this uh, global uh, pandemic in coronavirus affected first in China, and then it goes to the Europe and uh, Europe, and again it's come to the poor country like South Asia, Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, and other uh, rest of the world. So we had some challenges when the China was locked down, especially the organ industry. We didn't get the raw materials to produce the goods, and that was also one of the threat and we have some Indian factory where they are also producing to make the uh, 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 oven goods. So that was the one is scary. If the raw materials is not coming, what will happen? But it is immediately uh, the first uh, the uh, first uh, corona case came to Bangladesh on eight March. So after that, uh, uh, after few days, then we got informed from the BGMEA that. Uh, they invited few of the labor uh, union and uh, group to us that most of the brands are going to cancel the order, postpone or suspension the order. So then Bangladesh government, they locked down uh, uh, from the uh, 26th of March. So during that time, that also the government uh, decision that public private sector will be locked down, but export or the industry, it will be not uh, uh, under the lockdown. So then 26 uh, holiday and 27 is a Friday weekly holiday. So uh, then 28, the workers went to the factory and they raised their voice about that, why the uh, our, our safety and security is not work, uh, work. So then, you know, the workers also, we demand, and then suddenly they closed down the factory until uh, 4th uh, April. So then the 4th April, the workers didn't get any instruction or anything from the management. They said, come to factory and need to work. And you know, the lockdown, the transportation, everything is closed. Then the factory started. The workers came by Friday, Saturday by work, 200 uh, to 250 kilometer uh, by work. And they came to Dhaka. And there was a lot of uh, 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 criticism and a lot of uh, things are going on about the uh, log, uh, the garments workers and the media union. We raised this issue. And after that, middle of the night, BGME president declared the garments factory will be closed until uh, 11 um, April. So then workers, some came to Dhaka, some in countryside. It's also very uh, uh, mass situation. And then there was the waste time. And also we request, even the, before the lockdown, even after the five or something, the please pay the worker salary. It is very important for their uh, livelihood. 
but you know it's also then also the dg also said that uh, as per legal law the seven working days you will get the wages uh, this kind of things but also the good things you know the before the uh, lockdown some of our union factory they pay 20 uh, 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 25th of uh, march their salary wages and also they are uh, following the gov government rules and guidelines but uh, that was like uh, a factory or something because we have nearly 3000 factory so when the wage issue come out the every day the workers are protesting and fighting and they are asking for wages there is no social distance there is no um, safety issues even during that time also many factory close uh, open some factory they said we made marks but maybe one line they make marks and um, uh, and rest of the floor is doing the production so it's a uh, things and then the workers the march salary is still now few of the uh, uh, some of the factory didn't pay and uh, uh, this is and even you see the workers when raise their voice they are uh, asking for their wages and they protest in the road and they had a false case against the workers they have a uh, when the road block the police was beaten and trying to move, remove from the highway one garments workers and one uh, public two workers also die so this is the common scenario in whole supply chain you know happen in our country uh, and globally because that nobody is taking the responsibility even we thought the uh, the rana plaza can change the system but there is still not change in the system and whole supply chain and the uh, profit are taking uh, brand are much profit goes to the brand and also our supplier so these things are unfair uh, bad for supply, uh, purchasing practice and uh, today i'm talking but please give me some time because our uh, difficult things need to be worked the how uh, unfair and imbalanced supply chain are working and our workers are vulnerable situation so this kind of things are we are working and the workers are problem workers also get and in the meantime the company wants to uh, all the urgent shipment if they don't pay uh, they are send the shipment they will be lost their money and in the meantime also the brand people canceling the order or postpone or suspension after that they want discount 10% to 30% and then uh, the company also need to uh, the supplier need to be send their good immediately and then for the, uh, the bgme are asking how we can open the factory then we told we need to proper communication and coordinating among the union workers supplier um, owner government and other stakeholder different related ministry especially the health ministry because this uh, 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 this is the diseases and it's also viral uh, and that kind of things so you know that uh, kind of things are not properly communicate nobody is respect from the buyer side not from the supplier side even from the government side even the uh, european american who are the uh, uh, government are also responsible because profit goes to all uh, countries and uh, exploitation goes to the um, our uh, females girls who are producing goods so we are fighting for these issues and things and union we are very much strongly raise these issues and you know i am in, i am in very vulnerable situation at this moment because people are saying in the newspaper in the television in the talk show everywhere i am asking for uh, in the meantime also lost hundreds of workers lost retrains and also not to pay you know it's a messy situation and it's not properly uh, doing anything so then we are fighting as a union activist i am as a worker it's my responsibility to change the social change the workers things so you know so then in the meantime the when come to the april salary things so it's a very sad and unfortunate and unfortunate worldwide is a corruption that's also make for difficult for us as a as a union as a union member it's also shame for myself the union government and the bgme became at some of the union uh, the national level they decided also even the garments uh, some of them are agree that 60% workers for the garments workers but 
and not whose uh, salary, but you know the, the, the Bangladesh as a, is a living cost is very high. If they go 60% salary, 50 per half of salary goes for the uh, house rent, then 1,000 taka will be in their house, hand. Then how they have to get food, how have to take care of their children. And you know in Bangladesh, um, uh, 35 to 40% single mother. And these girls are working in this sector. Even the factory, when they open, not a single brand are monitoring their uh, factory, how the social distance, the safety protection or things are going on. And when I asked even the brand, and they said, we have very much trust with our uh, business partner, but the, you know, these things are not going on. So the in reality, in South Asia, like core country, Bangladesh, the workers are not going to die with the coronavirus, but we are going to die with the starving hunger. And no, that's, a very, that's a very important point, Nazma, you made because it applies across South Asia. And we've seen this happen, that uh, the choice often for the workers is between starvation and the virus. And that's a very cruel choice. And no one should have to face that. Unfortunately, we don't have Rubana who would have been able to respond to some of the points you're making. But maybe this is a point, Sanchita, with your permission, what I thought I will do is ask Dina, who has been observing the industry, if she has thoughts about how the industry has reacted. And just to paraphrase what Rubana may have told us is that she would have presented the viewpoint of the industry. And the industry's view is that they are squeezed by the international buyers. They find that a lot of companies have moved away from the contracts. They are not honoring the contracts. They are not paying for the raw material already bought. They are moving a pre pre negotiated agreement and they are caught in the middle. That is the defense that the industry has that they don't have support of liquidity from the state either. So, Dina, if you could reflect on that response on one hand, and I mean, you know, obviously we are speaking on her behalf and not really speaking on her behalf. She is not here. So, we are not trying to be spokespeople on, the par on, on that part. But just to empathize with that situation of where they are caught on one hand and what more can you expect and what is the role of the Bangladesh government if you can reflect on that and then I'll come then we'll come to you Payal about the some of the brand questions on that yeah all right thank you and thank you Sarid, for inviting me um let me say a few things I will not speak on behalf of um the manufacturers, but I can give my analysis of what's going on. I want to start by saying something, and I think Najma actually referred to that, which is that there is a lot of heterogeneity within the garment industry. Okay, so there are, um, not all factories are the same. Some factories do in fact pay their workers on time, many don't. Some factories are you know, either in size or in profitability or labor practices, there is considerable difference. So when I talk, I will be talking um, in general terms. And I know there are exceptions. And know this happens. Yes, there are some good factories that have good practices. But I'm going to talk about the general scenario without getting into a story about villains and heroes. Right. Um, and, and I want to start with a few words about what the pandemic has done. I mean, it's wreaked a lot of havoc and a lot of destruction and death, but it's done something else, which is I think it's had a very illuminating effect in that it's exposed a lot of myths. I think that myths that we know are myths, but it's exposed the workings of power um, in particular ways, the things that we don't, you know, that we think of as invisible, especially in this prevailing logic. And it's allowing us to, it's disrupting our older ways of seeing or not seeing, of unseeing. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean in a moment. Um, one of the things the pandemic has made it impossible to ignore is the power asymmetries in the global supply chain, what Santita was referring to. And I think at some level, I would say the hollowness of corporate ethics, of the idea of business ethics, okay? Um, the tremendous power that brands have over lo local manufacturers means that brands can actually push down prices as much as they can do realistically. And then local factories then are um, pass on the, that burden to workers in various kinds of ways, 
either by um, lowering prices, lowering the number of, decreasing the number of workers by speeding up what workers do. But then there's a whole system. It's a global supply chain. It's all global. So um, the manuf the brands have the most power along the supply chains and the brands have used it. This is exactly what happened with after Rana Plaza. And it's to me, it's astonishing that we haven't talked about this more, um, that the prices that brands paid to Bangladeshi factories, we all know about it, were pushed down to levels much lower than they were before the Rana Plaza collapse. There was no justification. There was no market justification for that. It was simply bec because the brands could, right? And that is something that local factories have had to deal with. The smaller factories couldn't. Um, but what the larger factories did in order, or if you want to maintain a level of profit, what do you do? You cut your workforce, you get, you speed up work, you do all of those things. That's what happens. Um, so there is something basically problematic about the supply chain, which, uh, gives me a certain, I, um, I understand where, um, local manufacturers feel that they're being squeezed. That's absolutely true. Now, I think we're at a different moment now because at that point, Bangladeshi manufacturers were in a very defensive pose uh, moment because they were seen as the source of um, the collapse of the Rana Plaza thing. It was the way in which... Uh, the whole narrative was put, it was simply a problem of local governance, simply a problem of local uh, corruption, right? So the responsibility for the collapse focused on local failures, as um, Hassan Hashraf has said, um, on the failed building. You didn't need to look further up the supply chain at all. You didn't need to ask why those workers felt forced to go into the um, factories. It was because of uh, very short lead times. This happens all the time. It was because there was pressure, production uh, pressure to ship things on time. Otherwise the factories might have lost um, their shipments. So it becomes localized. The, the difference today is, and I think it's interesting that PGNEA is um, now appealing to brands the onus is on the brands today. Everybody can see, it's clear, um, everybody can see if the brands withdraw women's lives in Bangladesh change. So I think we're in a different position. That does not take away the responsibility of garment worker, of garment factory owners in Bangladesh or of the BGMEA. This is an industry that's been there for 40 years, okay? If it's supposed to be what we call a uh, uh, signifier of tech shui, um, of sustainable development, then surely how is it that the industry doesn't have a safety net? Right? I'm, I'm just going to you know, leave it there. Yeah, no, no, I raised some very important okay. points. And just so that everybody knows, uh, you might see on your right hand side a red dot next to the word polls. And we have a poll for all our participants, participants, and we have more than 100 of you. So please do take part in the poll and we will declare the findings as we go along. Um, but uh, uh, lots of questions for brands. And I think this might be a time to bring you from Hong Kong, uh, Payal. Uh, of course, uh, you have a very positive and interesting story to tell about what you have done and how you have reacted. So if you can talk about what you have done and then perhaps speak a little bit about some of the generic points being raised about what are the structural issues with the industry. Great. Uh, thank you, Saleh. I just want to start by saying that it was a little bit unfortunate that I could not hear Nasma and uh, Dina here. Uh, so I will say at least uh, what has been uh, the work with... Can I, can I quickly paraphrase in two sentences? It will be a gross injustice to them, but at least so that you know. Uh, Nasma was essentially talking about the situation in which the workers are, the fact that some of the workers are single women, the fact that they are paid poorly, the fact that Rana Plaza and Tazreen incidents actually expose them to greater vulnerability. And she gave the scenario of how history built up. 
um, leading to the COVID crisis and uh, the steps that have been taken and how they feel at a loss, for example. And uh, Dina was speaking about uh, more about the structural issues with the industry. Is this fast fashion model that Sanchita was talking about necessarily the right one? Is this really a problem with the one building that collapsed? Is that what we are talking about? Or is there something far more structural, far more important, far more significant that we should bear in mind? And what are the longer term uh, responsibilities of companies from the perspective of corporate ethics? What does it mean in the context of globalization? This is a gross generalization of what both have said. It's much richer. And I'm sorry to both of you for paraphrasing it in this way. But please, over to you, Payal. Thanks, Salil. Thanks for interpreting it and, uh, you know, making the stage for me to express what H&M has done together with the partners in, in the context of Bangladesh. I think as a company, we've been very lucky by having our presence in the local sourcing markets and Bangladesh being one of the markets for H&M Group. By having our presence locally, we have been in constant dialogue with our business partners, with local stakeholders, including uh, the unions, including the industry associations that has made possible for us where we are in terms of supporting the industry. I think we, we, we do acknowledge all of us, and I will still repeat that this crisis where we are has caused an unexceptionable situation, a situation where no one has been before. So it has affected people, communities, and businesses around the world. Having said that, of course, there brings a lot of responsibility for, for a company and also for all the national and local stakeholders to take situation to drive a change, to build a resilient future. When it comes to the company, the buying that we do out of Bangladesh, the biggest commitment that we make is to secure that we pay for all the goods that are produced and all the goods that are in production, hereby standing with our standard purchase agreements with the Bangladesh industry, but also globally for all our supply chain partners. Secondly, uh, having a global presence and having a local presence, not only working with national actors, but we have worked with international experts, international associations, organizations, and peer group to identify where and how we can contribute, whether in terms of wages, which is living up to our contracts, safety, identifying the needs of personal protective equipment for the industry or for the national health institutes, whether it is in Bangladesh or all other countries where we have our supply chains. And when it comes to Particularly on women's issue, we do understand Bangladesh has more than 70% of the workers who work in the garment textile industry. And this is, has been a tremendous um, reason for them to come out of their poverty line and also contribute to the economics of the family. We as a company, our foundation has been critically looking an, into these issues and have a new project that they want to create uh, in contact with the key partner organizations and NGOs to exact establish a structure and design with various components looking at gender lens. So this is something that we want to kind of reflect overall from the perspective of what we as a company are doing and how we are engaging with our suppliers in terms of having constant dialogue to understand the situation of the businesses and also the needs of the workers. The other advantage I think we have is by having a global framework agreement with the international unions, 
we have been working with the national monitoring committees, which is the implementation platform of GFA by having a bottom-up voice of the workers. And I would, I would, I mean, of course now uh, Nasma and me cannot have a dialogue here on this platform since I can't hear Nasma, but would be great to also have Nasma there talking about the National Monitoring uh, Committee where Nasma has been a lead anchor supporting h &M and supporting the garment workers in driving that voice, which is important for us to hear in these tough times to bring their concerns forward. So I think that has been one of the the, the great implementing partner uh, when it comes to having bottom-up dialogues. I also want to uh, highlight the role of ACT, the country consultation groups with the tripartite structure, having the industry association, uh, industrial local trade union, the IBC, and brands and our brand peers together in that platform to discuss the COVID-19 impact and how we as a peer group, not only h &M, but together with my peers and our peers, how can we come up with solutions that bring industry to, to a more resilient and a, a future for where we want businesses and we want workers to be back. I would I would want to stop here and and uh, you know summarize that this has been the key areas where H and M has been working in in the in Bangladesh context. Uh, in AK, I thought I'll, I'll tell you've been very patient. Uh, you heard now from both Nazma and you know the situation on the ground. You know H and M, and you also obviously have noted the other story about H and M that they refused to invoke the force measure aspect of the contract and they are honoring their commitment, which makes them, uh, uh, you know, comply with uh, the best practices that we would expect from companies. Um, King, how, how is the Bangladesh government's response? What do you, how, where do you think we are today? Yeah, thank you, Salil. And, and thanks everyone. It's uh, very interesting to hear and a good opportunity to, to share. Um, I think from our side, what we, see happening with the COVID-19 in Bangladesh and elsewhere is indeed, as I think Dina was saying, it's putting in very stark picture of that the failure over the past decades to properly invest in social protection mechanisms across the supply chain and to pay living wages. Those two things combined have left workers in the global supply chain without savings to overcome this event and without a safety net. And I think if you look at other countries in more in Western Europe, what is happening is also very uh, difficult for workers, but at least the combination of some savings and a safety net have also left workers at the lower end of uh, uh, the supply chains here, whether in retail or in logistics, with a means to survive these months. Those means, as Nazma was saying, are missing very much in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, in India, and in other countries. Now, what could have been done over the past years, very obviously, has been to pay a living wage to enable savings and to invest in social protection measures. And I want to give the example for Bangladesh of the employment injury legislation. And we got a commitment after Rana Plaza that there would be such an employment injury legislation put in place. It was part of the Rana Plaza arrangement, which is less well known as the Accord, but which all of us worked very hard on to get these workers their compensation. Seven years on, that legislation still isn't in place. And that was a very cheap piece of legislation because that was the price of a T-shirt per worker per year, which if applied collectively would have at least enabled payments in case you have employment injury. That's not unemployment insurance, which is the other big component of social protection or sickness uh, insurance. Those are the three key elements here. But because of the, um, people talked a lot about the downward pressures on pricing. And I think indeed many brands now not even paying for their order is like the most extreme example of, uh, um, you know, unjust uh, behavior, if you wish, of brands across the supply chain. But that employment injury legislation is interesting because it is so cheap. Employers in Bangladesh could easily have afforded it. 
brands could, you know, without even blinking an eye, could have taken it out of their uh, uh, FOB price or put it in as a top up. So one of the big reasons why these things aren't happening is also because there is no international regulation forcing uh, uh, payments and cost sharing across the supply chain and forcing at least uh, uh, wage payments that enable saving and social protection measures. And I think that is something that is important to note here because with all respect for the framework agreements, initiatives like ACT and others, it's the voluntary non-binding aspect of them that makes them fail. That's what happened in the 20 years before even RANA, right? The workers indeed went into the unsafe building because they were due their, their March wages at the time, right? And they, uh, but the building had been declared closed. We also had so many fires and so many building collapses and a lot of measures that just weren't sufficient. We tried very hard with the accord and the arrangement, but even the Bangladesh Accord had a relatively weak clause in it around the commercial terms. That clause was in it. It got some money in, but insufficient. I think the big uh, challenge for us now is to take that knowledge and to say what is needed now is a proper regulatory mechanism across the supply chain that will force everybody, all the actors, to share costs of social protection, to share cost of living wages, to no longer allow, whether it's the manufacturer or the brand, to hide behind the, uh, 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 the yeah, how do you say that, this game of responsibility tech where it's always somebody else who should pay. Now, obviously, in generally speaking, it's the brands that have far more economic power and leverage and should be the first ones to say, we will enable this cost sharing, but at the same time, and, and the Bangladesh colleagues will confirm, if you look at the uh, amount of profit that have been made by at least a subsection of the, of the manufacturing, that's also been staggering over the last 20 years. And also in their good moments, they didn't decide to invest in, in social protection or in wage increases when they could have. So what we've been calling for is immediate measures to deal with COVID, including a wage guarantee, and, you know, for at least the current wages, even though they're not living wages, but also going forward to really say we need regulation and commitments from brands that will go to cost sharing, whether it's that through a top up of an FOB price or a tax that will say, look, for every country where you source, this is the investment in social protection that needs to be made. Your due diligence obligation, which, you know, in the EU at least will become a legal obligation includes that you need to make sure that there is enough financial means in your supply chain to pay a living wage and to invest in, in a social protection safety net. So I'll, um, yeah, I think these, these are at the moment our thoughts. We, we've been joining the campaigns to get brands to pay orders, but I wouldn't agree, Salil, that that is best practice. It's like saying, you know, you order a pizza and when the person comes to deliver it, that you're not saying, well, I've changed my mind. I'm not going to take my pizza. If I order clothes online from H&M or anybody else, I'm supposed to pay my bill. To me, that's not best practice. That is the, the bare minimum of compliance with the law in other countries. Best practice would be to now say, we're going to make sure that all the workers have an income guarantee for the coming months so they can stay home in order to stay safe. And then we will indeed reconstruct this supply chain to include the measures that we all know are needed and we will cost it out. And then that might mean more expensive clothes, less production and a different uh, regionalized base of production. But that is a good thing. That is also for workers ultimately a good thing if that wage guarantee and that social protection guarantee is built in. Can you talk specifically about sort of contractual clauses or what could you have in contracts, like a very specific thing that would would prevent something like this from happening. I mean, Nikki, as you mentioned, you know, it seems like it's it should not be out of the ordinary that brands should be, you know, continuing their commitments. I mean, that should not be a sort of a strange stretch, but it, we're seeing that it, it's turning out to be out of the ordinary. So, I mean, what are some practical things that can be done for both of you in sort of in the contracts themselves that actually we don't see this sort of thing happening again? <laughs> I mean, I think the, what you would need for social protection would be to have uh, a binding agreement between labor organizations and brands 
And under those agreements, brands would be obligated to engage in cost sharing with their manufacturer. So there would be a part of the FOB price, that's the price freight on board that you know is paid to the uh, manufacturer. A part of that would be taken out of it and be used for unemployment injury and for uh, employment, uh, unemployment, um, unemployment, not injury, excuse me. Um, I'm losing my English here. That uh, insurance, unemployment insurance and uh, employment injury insurance and sickness insurance. Those premiums normally are paid in many countries by the employer. In this case, in Bangladesh, the employer is saying we're not going to pay those premiums because the price doesn't allow us. If there is a contract or a legislation that would say it is legally you are obliged to pay that premium and the brand is obliged to make sure that it pays a price or it pays a top of on the price that will enable payment of that premium, then you uh, look at both actors in the supply chain. You don't say only to the employer, you need to pay a tax or an insurance premium that you can't pay. You say to the brand, you need to pay into it, or you could say at the European headquarter level, if you cannot prove that you know you are sourcing from suppliers that have paid into it, you will be taxed. And then that money goes back into a guarantee fund. There's a lot of ideas on how you can do it, but the core underlying principle is that you need to intervene into the pricing and costing of the supply chain. And you need to do that in a way that is binding upon both the employer and the brands, that you remediate the entire supply chain. You can make that binding either through legislation in US and Europe, which is going to be difficult even now, or you make it binding through contracts like the Accord, where you say at least the parties that have signed up to it are under a legal obligation to give effect to what they have agreed. But right now, what's missing, frankly, is really the will uh, again, of the brands and of the manufacturers to engage in something properly regulatory, whether in a, in a legislative framework or in a contract framework. And I think that is what we, we should expose Corona and say, look, this could have been still a very bad crisis with many people suffering, but it's only such a really bad crisis now in Bangladesh for garment workers where they are risking their lives and everybody else's lives by going back to work just to get their paycheck because they don't have the ability to either live off their savings or to get uh, 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 funding through you know, uh, a government system. Pyle, do you want to also say anything about contractual changes that you would see? Sanjita, it will be great if I can get the summary synopsis again of INEKE as well, because I couldn't hear that too. <laughs> uh, let's see. <laughs> Does, Salil, do you want to do the synopsis? Maybe you'd be better at it then. One of the points that NAK raised, and again, I'm paraphrasing, so please correct me, NAK, if I misrepresent you at all, but is that, you know, the, the price that is being paid in, should include a particular premium and the home governments, in this case, US and Europe, should probably create some kind of a tax mechanism, which directly goes to provide a protection in terms of wages and insurance, which covers health costs for the workers. That is one way it can be done. And the second part, part that she made, which was fairly early on, but I think it's something that has resonated for a long time, is for some way also to see what the consumer can do. Because in terms of, you know, what, what is the responsibility of the consumer? I mean, if we, and this goes back to the point Shanchita was making at the beginning, this whole obsession with fast fashion and cheap clothes and all that, that if we want a $2 t-shirt, I mean, obviously it's not going to be able to sustain the industry and whether there should be some cost pass along that way. So I think what, I mean, what's very clear in all this conversation is the absence of government. And maybe that's one of the points that you could probably explore. And here I'm adding to the questions put here, that is it is there a role for the government, whether it is US, UK, or Sweden in your case, uh, uh, Europe or Sweden in your case, or even the Bangladesh government? Because, you know, that's the missing bit here. You know, we are talking about the role of the consumer, role of the worker, and the responsibility of the corporation. But where is the state? Well said, and I think uh, it's great to, to highlight the role of all actors in this situation. I think, again, talking about COVID-19, where everyone is equally affected, right from the consumer who's not 
buying what we're producing and what we are able to sell. We wish we could produce more and consumer could buy more so that, you know, the whole mechanism could keep working. Uh, we felt like having the local present, having learnings from the country and local partners, we would be able to, to with this partnership, take our, our business better, build an industry which is sustainable and, you know, find the roles for every actor to take in order to deliver to a sustainable change, thus a sustainable fashion for the consumer. Having said that, I, I do acknowledge and learning from other countries, it is important to see that safety net is missing in Bangladesh, which other countries have. When it comes to layoffs, when it comes to retrenchment in these tough times, I think it is going across globally, be it on, on a manufacturing side, be it on a brand side, be it on a consumer side, it's everywhere the effect is big. So I think what here I would like to highlight and bring call to action where H&M has endorsed a uh, call to action, which has been driven by IOE, the International Organization of Employers, uh, ILO, uh, ITUC and industry all. And a couple of brands have signed and we believe that more and more brands should sign because this is how you're going to bring industry together and how the call to action delivers is on three aspects one holding brands responsible for their purchasing commitments as that's one of the foremost number two is addressing a midterm solution by bringing in funding through the IFCs to increase the cash flow in the tough times to secure the payments of the workers. And then finally, absolutely ensure a social protection system in the industry, in whatever countries we feel this safety net slash tax nets are missing in order to protect workers and every individual in the time of crisis. Of course, now when you look back on Rana Plaza, things have, I mean, <laughs> I, I read an article where it said Rana Plaza looked like baby uh, crisis in the crisis that we are in today. So I think from a budget, from a financial perspective, we wish we, I mean, people could have funded and created a midterm solution. But in these times, it is important that we as an industry, not only buyers, but all the MSIs, all the stakeholders together as ILO and IOE, together with ITUC and industry all has brought together the industry, the MSIs, the brands together to create this three steps here and now, midterm with funding and securing cash flow and securing a safety net in all countries, not only in Bangladesh, where this should be brought into place. And whenever tough times are there, then it is for the industry, not only for a government worker, but for every worker, you know, who, who's, who has an employment and whatever structures and places that they work for. So I think this is something that call to action will be able to bring this forward. And I think it's time that we all sign up for this to secure that we are able to deliver the promises that call to action has reflected. I'll now turn to, uh, I think, uh, Payal and um, Iniki, both of you, uh, because the call to action is a very good segue to speak about my next question, which is really about the scope for collective action, because clearly it's not the responsibility of one company, one organization, one entity, or one initiative. And Pyle referred to the MSI as the multi-stakeholder initiative. And of course, there is a cord, which is the more widely accepted one. And some American manufacturers are still wedded to alliance. I mean, I'm looking at the questions that are coming in. And again, people have asked about what can accord and alliance do. And of course, they were special purpose vehicles created essentially to deal with industrial safety. But now we are in a shift kind of situation. 
be your ash? What would be, I mean, first in AKU and then Payal, what would you want uh, that collective action to say? And then Nazma will come to you after that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's really important that we um, look also at where previous calls to actions, codes of conduct, voluntary initiatives, and so on have failed. Because this is not a new problem, right? It's not as if nobody realized that there was no unemployment uh, insurance system in Bangladesh, just like it was not the problem that nobody realized that the buildings were unsafe. It's not that we haven't been spending 20 years telling people that the wage is insufficient to have any savings on. So there is no safety net because a large part of the safety net comes from your ability to save. It's not just a state system. So I think... Well, on the one hand, you know, it's good to have that call to action and we have been giving a lot of input in it. It misses uh, enforcement mechanisms very much on all levels. It misses concrete targets and this clock is ticking very, very fast. So, yes, uh, by all means, especially if indeed the cash flow situation is improved rapidly and if that then translates into actual payments to workers, still we will need an enforcement and an oversight mechanism. What can the accord do specifically on the Bangladesh situation? Workers and unions have been sending complaints into the accord because as far as we are concerned, this clearly is a safety issue. The accord has on the ground ability across the sector to move things forward. But of course, partly that's been undermined and in that sense, it's a pity that Rubana isn't on the panel by this insistence on transferring you know, this into the RSC in the midst of all this instead of using the abilities of the accord to say, monitor the factories that are reopening, check their safety, deal with complaints, because the grievance mechanism is one of the good features on it, and indeed make sure that payments into social protection and payments into building safety out of these supply chain commercial terms, that that clause is strengthened. And I think I want to come back earlier to what you were saying, what about consumers? And Pyle at one point was saying, we wish we would all could continue to consume and produce. We need a radical change of this supply chain. Consumers didn't ask for that cheap clothes or that fast fashion, right? The problem is indeed, if there is going to be collective action, it needs a regulatory frame around it, because otherwise there will always be companies who will blame other companies or brands will blame suppliers. And again, to look at history, it took us five years to get the 30 million for the Rana Plaza compensation, which was a minimal compensation, right? That wasn't a compensation that covered actually uh, uh, injury, that just covered medical costs and, and income per the previous payments. If we want to do something at scale right now with Corona, it needs to be a scalable model that cannot be different statements from MSIs, from IOE, from other people, and then just hope that all stakeholders will take their responsibility and do their thing. So I think for me, collective action comes with a recognition that yes, if there is to be level playing field and strong action, it needs enforcement mechanisms that we all then need to live by. And those cannot come from country by country, government by government, we, we know very well that that will not work. Uh, uh, if you have some thoughts, and then I'm going to come to Nazma on that. Um, again, it's so, so wait that I start just by talking of what I feel is important. And I, I totally understand uh, that a safety net is important and must happen. And from a buying point of view, the cost of it has to be incurred in the cost of the product and across the value chain. And I think that is something that we always stand for, having a fair costing, ring fencing the labor cost to secure that the full labor cost, whether it's including of wages plus uh, in terms of benefits and social insurance, that will be part of ring fencing the labor cost, securing that we have commitments to our responsible business practices. And these responsible business slash purchasing practices is not only for what we stand for as a company. Now, being a member of ACT, we also stand together within the ACT platform and want to commit to that more publicly and we want to be also transparent to secure that we are buying responsibly and securing all the commitments when it comes to our purchasing practices. 
Uh, and coming back, uh, I, I will be very honest to say that we have always worked with our business partners with a genuine partnership approach, standing with our commitments, standing with our standard purchase conditions. And of course, we don't want to build a neo-colonist society again after COVID. We, we believe that, I mean, we need to have a sustainable future sustainable fashion going forward. Having said that, I also want to emphasize the, the partnership of Global Framework Agreement and working together with sound industrial relations, which creates a, a multi or tripartite platform where we can bring all the three parties together to kind of agree, agree on a collective decision, which is a win, 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 a win for a, a, a supplier, a win for the industry and a win for the worker. And ultimately bringing a value to the customer, what the customer wants to buy. But in order to make this happen, collaboration is the key. We cannot build up from an outside a safety net when it is not building in the local structures with the government, with the unions, and with the industry association. And I think that is the message that I want to, to say here, that a puzzle piece has, every puzzle piece has a role to complete the picture. And you try to fix it and try to represent someone else in that puzzle piece, it will not be a sustainable solution. You can do a quick fix in the industry, but will it drive a long-term sustainable change? That, that, that's really a question. So it has not happened before. It's a pity and we do agree that that's why we, we feel Bangladesh becomes more vulnerable and going back to what Sanchita said in the beginning, I think all of us have gone through Bangladesh. I have personally lived in Bangladesh for four years. I totally understand that. And 84% of the, the, the GDP, the country, is dependent on textile industry. That is why it becomes very unique for Bangladesh and very important for Bangladesh to secure all these pillars, all these pieces of the puzzle to create a sustainable future. And I hope that now with, with Call to Action, which has a pledge, which has a clear commitment on ensuring a safety net for the workers will be a success in terms of building a better future. A future where we can talk about equal partnership between a buyer and a supplier. We have sound industrial relation to secure that workers have a voice and ultimately an industry and a country where customers want to value the product that they wear in terms of where it is produced. So I just want to say that I, I really want to uh, address that it is important that we bring all the actors together to bring the change. We want to do all the very best in terms of the sphere of influence that we have, but we try our best in order to support both the workers and the industry and the businesses to stay strong and continue. And now, especially when the factories have started to open, we also want to continue to place the orders in terms of securing the economy aspect of it. And of course, as we talked in the beginning, economy and health, it's a fine balance. Where, where do you want to secure? Do you, do you want to control health or do you want to bring economy? And I think Nasma said in our statement in the beginning that it is tough that there are single mothers who are not able to feed their children. And those two aspects have to be brought together and continuously work with better safe working conditions, securing that workers have personal protective equipment, workers have masks now, they have hand wash stations. Of course, we see some good practices in the factories and we, 
we in the past have been in the factories, but in these tough times, we are also not able to go to the factories. But I just want to again go back of what I said. It is important role for everyone to take part, and I'm happy to share the challenges, the good practices that we learn from our business partners, and we get those reviews and. We try and take actions together, but if I have the recipe to all the solutions, that of course I don't, unfortunately. And I, I don't know how, uh, I'm not a COVID expert, neither a health expert, so I'm not a, neither an economist to, to, to build this equation. But the only equation that I can say is that the collaboration is key. Before I go to you, Nazima, very quickly, we did ask a question to Rubana. And she has replied, so let me just quickly read out. We asked her, what do you think of a law that insists on unemployment, sickness, and injury insurance to be built into the cost of garments? And who should pay? And what should Bangladesh government do? And what should Western governments do? And this is her reply. We contribute 0.03% of our export proceeds to a central fund. That takes care of the workers. There is employment injury insurance that's already agreed and a pilot is being launched as soon as possible. We think it is time for shared responsibility and accountability. The brands, employers and governments must all come together to implement this. I mean, I know it's a WhatsApp message and WhatsApp message response. Uh, it's not uh, as detailed as it could have been had she been here, but I just thought I would share that. Uh, Nazma, very quickly your thoughts and then I have a, a question for both you, Shonchita and Dina as the experts um, who have been observing this as academics on this. But first you, Nazma, very quickly, then the two of you and then we will probably have 10 minutes and there are very, very rich questions and my suggestion is that we'll take some of them if we can and if not, we will put them up and we'll put the questions to the panelists, get very quick responses and put them on the website. But Nazma. Uh, I think uh, while things, because she said that uh, uh, power should be uh, equally so if the brand are not a fair, then it goes. Because you see, the profit is goes to the owner and the brand. And then uh, the, uh, and, and now uh, the it goes to the work, workers. Why? So if we are talking about the power, the welfare, as Ineka said about the uh, uh, employment uh, insurance issue, which is Rana Plaza, is half of the done, but still is not working. So this global standard we need to be maintained, and also this uh, the things we need to the brand should be more responsibility because they take more profit, and then supplier also take. Uh, um, the, uh, there are, the brand is taking more profit and asking for cheap price, cheap labor, and then the manufacturer has also uh, uh, mistake because they are also want to happy the brand and take their profit. But nobody's uh, the brand, uh, supplier is not talking about their welfare and livelihood. So that is why the things, if we really wanted to equal power, you see the, our parliament majority in the business people are in that. So the things are controlling by them. So that is why the power need to be distributed equally and the corruption need to be done. And also we need to freedom of association, collective bargaining in the ground of the factory level boys, living ways, decent thing. And you know, this is the, the uh, pragmatic, uh, the a new lesson learning for us because we were not ready for that, but we don't have social protection. Uh, uh, climate change, natural disaster, many things will be uh, addressed and all the Bangladesh is very vulnerable situation on the climate change. So all everything is going to affect our uh, workers and our workers' livelihood. So nobody is taking the uh, risk, uh, giving us respect and dignity as like a modern day slavery. So how long we have to do that? Because this sector is 40 years and I know the h &M started business in Bangladesh since 1995 or 96. So that during that time to restore do even that today the business, for example, the BGNE president, how many factories do they have and what kind of business they expand through the sector? And 
they didn't get their 100% salary and their brand asking discount for 30%, uh, uh, 10% to 30%, the uh, supplier asking worker salary 40%. What kind of world? It's a shame. How they are uh, treated this kind of issue because they are not uh, thinking about their life. How many manufacturers went to the factory because these rigs are worker taking and they are producing good. And how they are not realizing this thing, how things are going this bad life uh, threatened and they are going to work. They should pay the health. Uh, bill and the, the allowance, but they are not paying the salary. They cannot pay the salary. They cannot pay the salary. Why? Because these people, if they don't get the salary, what will be happen the production? Because if the workers get 60% salary, the house uh, 50%, and then 1,000 taka will be their hand and survive with their family and how to give that fast fashion corruption uh, production. That is the question now. That is why if we talk about the all players should be work, all players have to work, then the power should be given equally. They have to pay fair and ensure and livelihood. Because without it will not sustain. We are talking about the sustainable goal 20, 20, 30. It's failure. If the workers are not getting the ways, if workers are and workers are hunger because people are not care about the coronavirus because world is you are working distance working in the home but the production country like bangladesh we work in the uh, labor density and we we have no security but you people are uh, talking about the uh, human rights you are talking about the business kind of business and human rights we are uh, people are protecting us exploitation and uh, the slave all kind of things. Now the time need to be realized because see, one minute, brother. Yeah. One, uh, that see the big politician, all the powerful people are also affected coronavirus. Oh, time to everyone. We're losing you, Nazma. Very passionate call from Nazma. I think uh, maybe, um, Pyle, you were not able to hear us. So very quickly, her point was that the, all the profits are going to the owners and brands. The insurance is important, but it's not working. Global standards have to be maintained, but every company has made more profits. H&M has expanded significantly since the time it came to Bangladesh. But why is it that the workers um, face, are facing the risk? They are facing the risk by going into the factories. Um, and um, um, something and obviously there is need for collective action to deal with that. Um, but I'll pause there. I don't think we need to respond to that right away. Uh, we have about um, 15 minutes. So maybe Dina, I'll come to you first and then to Shanchita. Uh, there is one question. You don't have to answer that, but it's a very interesting question with a lot of upvotes. So let me read out that question and because it does deal with globalization and you might want to talk about that. And then Shanchita, your reactions to what we have all heard today. This is a question from Gil Daniv, and it is, is it possible that the pandemic will trigger a further race to the bottom as manufacturers will start competing with each other to attract whatever orders are left, hence entrenching the global power inequalities that you have mentioned earlier, Dina, the question is specifically referred to you. And are you, and maybe the panelists can very quickly react, are, are you optimistic or pessimistic about that? And then maybe after, maybe if uh, Payal and Ineke want to talk about it, that's great. And if not, Shanchita, if you can offer some remarks. And I'll also scan through questions if we have time. I'll, I'll add one or two more questions. But Dina, over to you. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Geert. That's a great question. Um, and in fact, I was thinking about it right now. Will the pandemic trigger a race to the bottom? It's likely to, especially if we take a short-term approach in each of our countries. Uh, we must save as many jobs as we possibly can, take on orders in a very low, you know, at very low prices. But I do think that one of the things that this 
the timing is now. Ineka was talking about international regulations. I think this is the time when actually a lot of, I was talking about myths being uncovered. I think the myth of companies coming into places like Bangladesh, you know, and lifting the women out of poverty. And this is not to say that Bangladeshi garment workers have not benefited, but that myth of companies are almost doing Bangladesh a favor. That needs to be undermined. And once you undermine that, then if you, you know, <clears throat> you can perhaps begin to provide a counter narrative where international trade rules right now are not are so for you know are so geared toward the very powerful i mean the whole idea of having trade rules a, a force majeure clause what is it it's just a way out when things get difficult so you don't have to keep your word why on earth do we have that and if we have that why can't we have international regulations that are a little more equitable that's one thing. The second thing about the race to the bottom and globalization, I, you know, it's a good chance for this, uh, you know, it's, I think there, there is a space, the pandemic may be a portal, as Arundhati Roy said, maybe. But it really, for a place like Bangladesh, you were asking about the state, and I do want to mention this, Bangladesh is actually a weak state in the global order. So when it does go into talks, trade talks, it is um, negotiating from a weak position. That's the first thing. And where is the state in this? This is not related. Is uh, It's not always clear whether the state is uh, working for the interests of all citizens or whether uh, because of the outsized influence of the BGMEA, state interests and corporate interests or the interests of capital get very, very entangled. And you see this in the way the police have treated in, in the completely arbitrary decisions and forced movement of garment workers, as I can see, but also in, in whose interest the police is sometimes stopping workers and not stopping workers. So I don't think I'm, I'm really going to be able to answer that really important question, but I, I think I would not be entirely pessimistic, but because one has to always have hope. Leave it yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That optimism has to be the st the starting point of that. That's and and the state. When you mentioned about the state role, uh, an article in the Cambridge Journal for uh, Human Rights and Business about three years ago with my former colleague Motoko Aizawa, and one of the things we found was that one third of the members of parliament in Bangladesh, at least. Um, have some interest in the industry, which of course distorts decision making because it means that the machinery they buy and import tends to be without um, uh, import duty. And the other is that there is obviously pressure on, there is no pressure on the parliamentarians to increase wages because uh, they are also, some of them are also the owners. But that's, uh, I mean, state capture is a problem not unique to Bangladesh. It happens to other countries too. But I think it's particularly uh, interesting in this case. But I just thought I'll add that factoid here. Yeah. So a little, uh, I can yeah, yeah, just yeah. quickly respond and then maybe the other. So I'm just following up on what Dina said. I don't have anything, you know, dr dramatically different to say other than that, you know, I spent sort of the last five, six years really thinking about Rana Plaza and what, what happened after. And oftentimes it's these, you know, disasters and crises that sort of reframe everyone's thinking. And we start wondering, you know, well, what, how did it become this? And as some of the panelists have said in AK and I, this is nothing new. I mean, we're, it's just, and, and as Dina mentioned in our opening remarks, I mean, it's just bringing it to light in, in a more uh, obvious in your face way. This has been happening for the last, you know, 40 years or so. What I worry and not to be also agree that we must have hope. And these are times where we, you know, it, it is an opportunity. It is a real opportunity, actually, to make some positive change, to bring different groups together. My worry is, and just going back to the Rana Plaza incident and post, you know, what happened, the focus after these in, these disasters or these crises often tends to be very narrow. So what's the immediate fix? You know, in the case of Rana Plaza, as many have said, it's, it's it was the building and we want to fix the building and structural issues. Again, that's, that's, it shouldn't be neglected, of course, but it, it neglects 
the you know many other issues. So here I'm worried that we're going to focus on the immediate, which we need to absolutely. We you know workers need to be compensated. We need to worry about livelihoods, but that's a short term focus that we need to have. And that means that we want to make sure that the, you know, the, the brands are, you know, continue their commitments, but we don't want to, again, miss this opportunity to look at the larger picture. So we want to go forward by thinking about, okay, well, you have the short term, but then the long term, you know, how do we make long term changes to the whole the whole global supply chain, which is, you know, problematic in many ways. I mean, and who we don't, in this case, as Dina also said, and, and some it has been some things have been written about this, which I think is important. Again, it's the brands have become the focus, rightfully, at this moment they should, but that does not absolve the Bangladeshi government nor the you know business community in Bangladesh. So we we have to be very careful how we move forward. And I just wanted to end with that, but maybe uh, other panelists would talk. Yeah, maybe if I if I could. Uh, just one second, just one second. We have about seven minutes. So what I'm going to do is uh, maybe two minutes each for all four of you, not Shanchita or me. Uh, and then I'll keep the last one minute for the announcement of the next session. So in a couple minutes for you, uh, Nazma, Payal, and then Dina. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, to follow up on that also from Chandita. Um, Kegrana Plaza, a court and uh, arrangement were the outcome of negotiations, right? They were a reflection of the leverage and the power that labor and, and the community worldwide had at that point in time. The, the original ask, if you wish, the, the, as, as Nazma will also remember, the, the September uh, 11 demands or the March 11, April 11 demands that were made already after, uh, before Tazlin. Right after Spectrum, that was a, a fuller set that would have, you know, included the freedom of association aspect, the the changes we want to see in the supply chain. So I think it's important to also understand that um, f going forward, that we need to look very carefully at where is our power and our leverage going to come from to push forward a bigger agenda. It's not that people aren't realizing that that bigger agenda is there, right? I think in most conversations, including actually with brands, they realize it. It's not in their interest, right? So they will accept, of course, the minimum. So the focus for Rana was strongly on, on, on fire and, and building safety, but with some avenues in it, in terms of empowerment through working committees and something to the grievance mechanisms and a halfway clause on commercial practices. Right now, we might push something through on social protection systems, on severance, and we all want to push through a more fundamental change in costing and pricing of supply chain because it's such a root cause and on enforcement. But I think, and, and that's something for the Institute, for the academics also around us, we need support in trying to understand where is our power going to come from to get a better outcome on the negotiations. It's not a lack of an understanding or of a political agenda. It's genuinely where is the leverage and the power coming from to deliver on it. And again, there is, of course, always a trade off on the immediate needs. As, as Nasma was articulating right now, the clock is ticking. We're losing a lot of time in order to give workers that income guarantee that they need so much while people are trying to get money from this government, that government, the international financial institutions and so on. But I think if we can uh, um, push through more of that income guarantee and, and focus on indeed the obligation uh, uh, under due diligence laws and under other ways to get uh, social protection mechanisms built into the price, not through a voluntary understanding of companies, but through an actual uh, uh, legislative or trade system, that could trigger uh, a longer term change. But I'm, I'm hammering because otherwise my fear is very much that we will indeed, you know, uh, um, manage to pull out some things in the negotiation table, but the longer term change will be left to all of the stakeholders working together and understanding each other. And that just will not uh, uh, deliver because it's always much more in the interest of various stakeholders to engage in the, in the short term profit. <laughs> Not the form. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Nazma, very quickly because I, I we're, we're running out of time, but I really want you to have your response here yeah, and thoughts. Thank you. Uh
Uh, actually, I want that, like, for example, Primark, they cancel some factory 100% order, and now they are asking to give some uh, workers ways or something. Actually, we don't want that kind of hypocrisy. We want proper order and proper uh, fair uh, 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 price and fair wages. It should be, and also, you know, we need to be, if this, something goes wrong, the workers always penalize, blacklisted their they lost their job but my uh are there it is any uh stakeholder are the guilty or the uh, mistake they should be also pen 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 sorry uh, penal uh, uh, legal charges because you know the brand are not fairly giving price treated well the supplier also do so globally, we need to be legal action how we have to do and also the things we need to work together, all stakeholders, and we need to work. And this time, how we have to ensure our workers' wages and their livelihood, their safety and their protection, it's need very important. Without them, the world will be collapsed. So short-term, mid-term, long-term, all kind of things. But the main social protection, the insurance uh, 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 scheme and all kinds of things need to address and how we can respect the female who producing good. And I am asking also consumer and all other stakeholders, please make accountable all the brand as well as supplier to pay their living wages and ensuring uh, uh, COVID-19, they will not hunger, they will not uh, uh, starving and they will not die with their family. and their safety is very important uh, and how we can uh, work on the different framework agreement and how we can accountable like legal binding like accord this kind of initiative and internationally we need to amendment new law and new policy because uh, the uh, run uh, this uh, covid also teach us where is the gap and where we need to be overcome so this is the lesson learning for everyone so we need to be stand up and please let us work together and respect our workers and again and again need to be paid fair. Otherwise, it will not overcome. Charity, modern day slavery, these kind of things need to be avoided. That is why the Western consumer union activists from Bangladesh, we need to fight and protest against the company like multinational fashion brand and other who are not treated. How we have to give them, see the Rana Plaza, Rana is out, the garment owner is out, nobody is punished. But why our workers? This kind of system needs to yeah. be changed. Corruption needs to be avoided. And power should be distributed again and again, again. And that needs to be done. And we need to be save our girls and need to be save our workers. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Nazma. Action and not words and accountability and dignity and not charity. Very, very powerful words indeed. Pile very quickly. And then Dina, I know you had your hand up. So I think you wanted to come back on something. Um, so very quickly, one minute each. And yeah. I will just want to close by saying that sustainability has always been part of the customer offer. And in this tough time and looking at the future, sustainability will be critical business requirement for us going forward. Uh, great to hear Nasma. Finally, I could hear you. I don't know what did you do with your computer, but it was good to hear your passionate voice talking uh, and fighting always for, for the workers. I just want to say and echo what Nasma said, accountability and ownership will be the key forward a partnership, a tighter partnership is something which will be more valued from transactional to more strategic, where as an equal partnership where a buyer can choose a valuable partner and a valuable partner can choose the right buyer to work with. I think this is where I, I want to say my final remarks. Thank you. Dina, if you have something to add, yeah. Following up uh, on something Santita said, which I really agree with, which is not to have just a very short-term vision on what needs to be done. And what we saw with the Accord is that while it was needed, it left the supply chain completely intact. It just really didn't touch it. And what we need to do, what we're seeing now, is that we really need to move away from 
the worker, what the workers' rights uh, consortium calls a failed supply chain model. We need to rethink it. And one more thing, people were talking about how we might have to pay more for clothes if we pay workers more. I just have a kind of radical idea. It was Marx's birthday too, a couple of days ago, but maybe brands could take a little less profits, just a little less, and maybe prices wouldn't have to go up dramatically. It's just a thought. Have uh, anything to add? Okay. No, I, I said, and I think we're running out of time. Yeah, so I'll be very quick with one note of hope, optimism, which goes into what Dina, you were saying, and Ineke and Nazma, you've been articulating, and Payal, you also would probably see some logic in it. We had a poll out, remember? Then the poll was that how much more, if anything, would you as a consumer be willing to pay for a T-shirt to ensure that workers' rights are protected in the supply chain? The good news is that one option was zero, and nobody voted for that. The other was a dollar fifty, which was the figure that Mama Dianus had come up with some years ago at the time of the Rana Plaza crisis. Twenty-one percent said that, and five dollars, which was the maximum we had put here, seventy-nine percent said that. So that's a very good marching order or instruction to the industry that yes, it's okay to charge more, and it's okay to charge more, not so much for to increase the profits of the industry, but to make sure that the workers uh, get what is truly their. I mean, the uh, result of their hard, hard, hard work and labor. So I think that's a very um, useful note. I'm not saying it's optimism. I'm not, I'm not even saying that's the way it will be, but that's the way to look forward to. Um, thank you once again. I know we had some technical glitches. I'm sorry, Rubana could not join us, but Nazma from Dhaka, thank you very much. Ineke from the Netherlands, thank you very much. And Payal, it's getting late for you in Hong Kong. Thank you very much for joining us. Dina, you and I should have another coffee in here in New York. Uh, I know we can't meet, but we'll have to make up for it. Maybe we can have it on screen. And uh, thank you once again, Shanchita, for two reasons. One, for waking up so early in California, and the other, for being such a wonderful co-host with us, the Shubir and Malini Chaudhary Center at the University of California, Berkeley. Just to remind you, on the 20th of May, we will have one more webinar, and which will be focused primarily on commodities. So please do tune in, and we will have the details on the IHRB website. The previous one we had is already on our website, and we'll probably have one more on migrant workers, probably one on health, and we are also thinking of doing something on technology and tracing, and we will keep visiting this issue because COVID is not going to go away. The business and human rights agenda is not going to go away. Businesses will stay. Workers will stay. Most important is that human rights have to be embedded, enshrined, and be completely part of the system so that we have more conversations about how to improve the situation and less about what went, what went wrong. Once again, thank you very much, everybody. Onek donna bad. <laughs>